Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Turbal and Jegera peoples as traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. And I'd like to emphasize that this land was never ceded. On behalf of everyone here and the institution for which I work, the University of Queensland, I would like to pay respect to the Turbal and Jegera peoples, their ancestors and their descendants, and their cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society and stand with them in solidarity. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement and solidarity to the traditional owners and custodians of the various lands from which you join us today. So uh, welcome to the final lecture in the 2023 People, Plants and the Law lecture series. Uh, one of the aims of the lecture series is to bring together personal historical reflections from some of the most important figures working on plants, people and the law over the last 40 years. And another aim is to showcase some of the best work happening currently in the area. We've been running for two years now, and you can find the details and recordings of last year's lectures, along with recordings of this year's lectures on the lecture series website. Uh, a quick point of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A section and we'll do our best to get to some of them after the talk. Uh, in today's lecture, we're showcasing some of the most exciting work currently under, being undertaken in the area um, in the form of a personal historical reflection. Uh, our speaker today is Graham Dutfield, Professor of International Governance at the University of Leeds. Most of you will be very familiar with our speaker's scholarly work, um, which is really so varied and so significant that it would be foolish to try and summarise it here. Um, I would just say that if you aren't familiar with Professor Duckfield's work, um, I recommend that you find a copy of that high design of purest gold as soon as possible. Uh, today, Professor Duckfield is speaking about one of his first works, written in collaboration with Daryl Posey and published in 1996. Beyond intellectual property toward, toward traditional resource rights for indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, this is a work intended as a guide for indigenous communities that speaks to the activism, which along with his scholarly work has been a key part of Professor Duckfield's career. Um, what's so fascinating about the talk in the offing today, and I think exemplary of the aims of this lecture series, is getting the chance to hear him reflect in an analytic way on a history of interactions between plants, people and the law in which he himself took part. Okay, that's enough from me. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Professor Graham Duckfield who will be speaking today on the beyond intellectual property moments in historical context. Thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you, Beres, and also thank you uh, to Phoebe for you know, setting this up. Um, okay, so uh, I was asked last year uh, by a group at Cambridge to uh, talk about this book that I co-authored, uh, which came out in 1996. And my first thought was, why on earth would anybody ask me to talk about a book that was written so long ago? Uh, but I thought, well, let's uh, let's talk about it then. But I'm going to talk about it in a way uh, that doesn't involve much talking about the actual book, but placing the book in context of the time. So um, what I want to do in my talk is to address two sets of questions. The first, why intellectual property? Why are we talking about intellectual property? In relation to the knowledge, innovation, and practices of indigenous peoples. Uh, and why do we call it beyond IP? So, what do we try to achieve with this book? Uh, and, and really importantly, why do we start talking about this subject from the late 1980s? Why was it the late 1980s rather than 10, 20, even 100 years before? Uh, or why do we start talking about it, you know, in the, in the 21st century? Was it at this particular time? And I've been puzzled about this uh, for a while, and I think I'm trying to strive towards uh, an answer. Uh, but um, perhaps more fundamentally, 
uh, the question uh, arises, or the set of questions arises of, uh, in order to us to think that these people had uh, legal rights in their knowledge, uh, well, to even think that runs counter uh, to 500 years of norms uh, that entail the dispossession of indigenous peoples, lands, uh, cultures, and, uh, uh, and also their knowledge. So what are these norms that needed to be overcome for us to even think that they had individual and collective for possessory rights Count them out to those of, say, authors or uh, corporate inventors or individual inventors, etc. How successful have we been in overcoming these norms and assumptions? Um, and does, uh, does does justice require us to fully reverse these norms? And should such reversal come before we strive to our advanced legal protection of TK? Okay, so there's a whole bundle of questions there in that. Uh, uh, second bullet point, uh, and I'll see what I can do uh, to answer. I don't think I have definitive answers because I'm still uh, working on this, but hopefully I'll be able to come up with a few interesting things to say. Okay, so my co-author, who was a great the B was Daryl Posey. Uh, Daryl was an ethno-ecologist, uh, also a political activist, and his political activism arose directly from his ethno-ecological findings. And that's, I think, something to hold on to. It's an incredibly important uh, fact. Um, other scientists were doing similar work. They were finding out that landscapes in indigenous territories, such as the Amazon rainforest and Australia and other places, were actually, actually, actually domesticated. They may not necessarily have domesticated individual plants, but they domesticated the whole landscape. And he was the one, a, a complete non-lawyer, not somebody who had uh, unschooled entirely in law, as I was and actually still am, uh, if I'm totally um, uh, I'm frank, which I really must be. Uh, it was him who thought that this is not just politically important, but actually it's legally important. And why is it legally important? Um, well, first, a little bit about his research. So he worked for um, a museum research center in Belém, uh, in Brazil, called the Emilio, uh, um, Emilio Guildi uh, Museum. And he launched a project called the, the Project Kayapo. Uh, Kayapo were the people that he worked with in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the Shingu Basin uh, of the Amazon rainforest. And he and his team were studying indigenous knowledge uh, because they were looking for really alternatives to deforestation uh, and other extractive uh, activities in the Amazon. Uh, and him and his team, uh, they found a lot of interesting things going on that were really invisible. So he was saying, look, these people are, there are, are they domesticated landscapes, ecosystems? But this is not something that is known about or appreciated um, by, um, by the, the orthodox science uh, by politicians, anybody else. Uh, so, and so one of his things was, was that he found out that these forest islands in savannah areas were actually planted in the past uh, by indigenous people. Uh, for They look wild, they look completely natural, but for him, they were not wild or natural, they were domesticated. Um, so, uh, of course, in terms of dispossession, uh, some of us might think back to, you know, John Locke, now, John Locke, of course, had this uh, theory uh, of property uh, where mixing your labor uh, with land uh, it, it, uh, entitles one to property, uh, property rights. You take uh, from nature and you turn it into something that is humanized uh, through your effort, your labor, and in so doing, you generate some property rights vested usually in an individual uh, uh, person. So John Locke in, in his uh, Two Treatises of Government has a famous quote, in the beginning of the world was America. And America was a place which was uh, uh, full of you know, tribal people living in a state of nature. Uh, he had never been there, so he assumed uh, they didn't really have sufficiently advanced in terms of, uh, of agriculture to have, uh, you know, plowing the, 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 tilling the soil to have actually 
any kind of political society. And without political society, there can be no property. So that land was available for possession by, uh, by Europeans who, uh, by tilling the soil, it generated individual property rights, which by the activity uh, became theirs. So he was sort of countering this. Now, um, uh, without going too much into this uh, article, uh, uh, it's a wonderful article by Manuela Caneta Cunha, who's, an, uh, who's a Portuguese-Brazilian um, anthropologist, University of Chicago, uh, and she is uh, also quite critical of Locke. He never acknowledged the existence of any agriculture or property in the Americas. Uh, but uh, what she does say rather interestingly is that domestication uh, and cultivation uh, from the perspective of the indigenous people was practiced by, uh, you know, by not just by, uh, by humans, uh, by, by every living beings and, and spirits. Uh, so it's a rather sort of uh, non-human centric uh, perspective that she offers. Uh, and what's interesting about this, I think, is that while uh, an anthropologist like Daryl can say that these peoples were lands landscape domesticators, that's not necessarily how they would see it, their role themselves. And that is fa fascinating, but also it, it opens up a little bit of a problem in that when uh, someone like Daryl argues that these peoples uh, have rights because, because they domesticate the land, um, you know, to get individuals to say the same thing, it's, it's somewhat in conflict with their own particular worldview, but it is politically useful. So they will often go along with this and say, yes, that's what we do. Uh, we, are, we are stewards or, you know, rather than necessarily owners of the land, or they say that too. Um, but, you know, in terms of, let's say, the, you know, the rhetoric, there's a political strategy here, uh, and 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 uh, indigenous peoples are very very wise to this in a way that they had to learn uh, over quite a long period of time. All right, okay. So um, and more could be said here uh, about her article, but uh, I'll just just go to, to the bottom part of this. Uh, agriculture, in its full sense, was deemed to practice in permanent fields and preferably with a plow. A plow, no doubt, sub, 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 subdues the earth more effectively than a stick, that those Americans merely scratched the land and ignored tillage could be grounds for asserting that their title property was dubious at best. And that's the thing, you know, you had to be, vis you know, you had to be uh, you know, visually, noticeably actually cultivating the land so that you had mixed your labor with the land and, and therefore were owners of it. And Indigenous peoples, they may practice agriculture and hunting, hunter and gathering. They may be all of one or the other. They often mix and switch between the two. And this just does not fit into the Lockean worldview, nor does it fit into the worldview of you know, Western, us Western people generally. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't see it that way. Either you're a hunter and gatherer or you are a farmer. Uh, you can't be a bit of both, switching between one and another. Um, uh, you may be somewhat nomadic uh, as well. You know, you, you, you either have to be one of these things, you can't be all three uh, and switch between, be, be, between them. Um, so, you know, Daryl sort of weaponized, you might say, I don't know if that's a good metaphor to use, but he sort of weaponized this uh, perspective on, uh, that he had uh, formulated with others that they were landscape domesticators. And so, look, if they uh, have. Uh, if they have self-determination, then they have sovereignty in relation to their, their lands. And that can be justified by the fact, not just because they have occupied their lands for thousands of years, but also because they have improved and worked the land as well, whether or not it's noticeable, but they actually are doing this. But sovereignty should also uh, extend to also to their culture uh, and their knowledge as well. So. Uh, so Dow uh, brought together our whole group of ethnobiologists in 1988 for a congress that took place in his institution in Berlin, and this was one of the first one of the first calls for compensation for, for the use of their knowledge. Uh, well, compensation sounds rather a bit, a bit timid, but yeah, you had to start somewhere. This was four years before the Biodiversity Convention, and the declaration was really quite important and influential. And for, for compensation, it didn't take too long uh, to start to talk about 
uh, to talk about uh, um, um, to talk about about intellectual property rights, but uh, more of that a little bit later. Okay, so what was, what's going on in in the nineteen eighties and uh, into the nineties? Um, I won't go into all of these in great detail, but you find there is a lot of talk about information, about information being more important than things. Information is what uh, is the wealth generator. Talk about the information economy, the, you know, the network society. Uh, and so this idea of, 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 of being knowledge based is something uh, that is generally used against the underprivileged. Uh, but at the same time, the underprivileged can also say that we have knowledge which is valuable. It, it, it forms uh, part of the information society, network society. So why aren't we getting something for what we actually contribute? And of course, IP law, uh, that's a, the, the Uruguay round, the extension of patent law to cover life forms, um, a, a perceived injustice felt by many uh, that we're giving away things for free. We're giving away our biodiversity, our uh, our, our TK for free, uh, and yet we have to pay for uh, uh, for the products that develop from the use as raw materials. Obviously, there's a massive concern about loss of biodiversity, and uh, you know the works of Daryl Frosey uh, and others about terrestrial landscapes fits into this sort of. Uh, um, this kind of concern uh, that perhaps, but also offers a kind of solution. Perhaps they are better than we are. Uh, maybe we need to respect their knowledge more. Um, and of course, it's not just about scientists by any means or, or others. Actually, indigenous people themselves are, are, are becoming themselves more networked internationally. United Nations plays an important role in catalyzing this process. But now you, you have the working group on indigenous populations in New York, the in General Assembly. Uh, you have uh, and, and you have these peoples from around the world all coming together, finding that they have many concerns uh, in common and strategies. Uh, so Dow would would have seen, seen himself as not so much um, a, a leader, uh, but someone who is actually following into these peoples themselves. Say, well, they're the ones who are setting the agenda, and we are we are supporting them. Uh, but the fact that I'm a scientist means that I. I I will be listened to in a way that maybe they won't in certain forums. Okay, so um, what are the three sources of the dispossessory norms? One is 500 years of international law. You, you, you're bucking five centuries of international law, uh, which if you think of international law as, as European in origin, uh, international law uh, is one based partly on, 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 on commercial activities between people and nations, but even more, it's about what to do about these large areas of land that have opened up and, and come under the, the possession of, uh, you know, of European uh, nations, first the Spanish and the Portuguese, the later the British and the French and so on. So there are 500 years of the dispossessory norms come from international law itself. Um, the second, I would say, is socially, social evolutionary thinking uh, that treated the practice uh, of visibly cultivating food crops in fields as necessary for property and landmarks to be assumed, assigned, and at, this is being a positive step toward being civilized. So socially evolutionary thinking, you know, so uh, if you are vis visibly cultivating, not in a way that, that Europeans can't really see what's going on. You know, a, a, a plowed field is a plowed field. Anyone who can see it's a plowed field, it's a farm, it's being cultivated. So that was seen as necessary for property to rights to be uh, uh, to, to be um, acquired. Uh, and it was seen as being a positive step. So you know, you, you start off being a hunter-gatherer and you go on to be a farmer uh, and, and so on. You become more um, civilized. Uh, so social evolution thinking uh, uh, comes up, uh, particularly in about the uh, the 18th century, the Enlightenment, and then 19th century liberalism that saw moral and economic progress in property rights be vested in individual, what uh, um, first and others has called have called possessive individualism. This is really important. In fact, some commentators have said uh, the worst abuses actually indigenous peoples were not when the Spanish first uh, colonized the Americas but actually the 19th century when they became individual property holders and that, that made it actually easier to, to dispossess them of land uh, than even beforehand. 
Okay, so we start off with the first, uh, let's say, as a dispossessory norm argument is the discovery doctrine, uh, which, uh, you know, goes back really to, the, you know, you know, the year after the, you know, Columbus uh, 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 blunders his way into, uh, you know, the new world, uh, never knowing it's the new world, thinking it was uh, the outlying, uh, the outskirts of Asia. Uh, you know, Pope Alexander the Sixth, um, his uh, papal uh, ball, and uh, I won't go into this into the terror, the rather notorious papal ball, uh, which justifies dispossession. Uh, but you have a duty to evangelize the people. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you're prepared to do that, then you can go and, and take the land uh, of your people. Um, there were some subtleties in all this. It wasn't all just pure dispossession. It was, you know, they, you know, they did have different rules depending on whether you're a Christian or not, uh, depending on whether uh, on, on whether you uh, had a had a civilization, uh, an urban society, as the Aztecs, uh, for example, did uh, or not. So there are different, you know, these norms are, are, are not complete. Shouldn't be treated as being completely to just pure dispossession, but nonetheless. Uh, it was all pretty terrible, and certainly uh, uh, in a in it, at a time when these kinds of, of, of rules were going out, were going out, the idea that they had, had rights to national knowledge would have been pretty much unthinkable. Yeah, unthinkable. It's interesting, uh, noteworthy, perhaps that the uh, it, the Vatican this year actually renounced the discovery doctrine. Uh, I would say perhaps it's five hundred years too late. Uh, but at least a bit better late than never, I suppose. Um, okay, now this idea about agriculture being so crucial um, is not just something that uh, Locke came up came up with himself. Uh, uh, others thought about this at the same time. Um, Emery Tofato was one of the uh, one of the founders of international law, as someone said, or at least one of the leading lights in the early centuries of international law. And in his, uh, he wrote the Law of Nations, the principles of natural law, in the mid 18th century. And um, he, he again uh, has uh, says about about agriculture. Being a farmer uh, is incredibly important. But you actually you have an obligation to actually use the land in an efficient way. And he he is pretty pretty critical uh, about wasting land. You know, if you're a hunter gatherer, you 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 use too much land. You're not using it properly, and therefore you don't deserve to own the land because you're just being so you know inefficient. You know, you're it's just it's just waste. Uh, and that's and this idea that hunters and gatherers they need to the the habitat has to be too big to support their lifestyle. It's, it has been used against them uh, from the start, uh, but it's still being used against them now. So, so these uh, have the names of who said this, but maybe I could say, could you guess uh, who's saying these things? There's actually ex-president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, uh, and he's basically saying, you know, that these reserves for indigenous peoples are an obstacle to agribusiness. You know, we can't even reduce indigenous land by a square meter. They're, they're just occupying this land, not doing anything with it. They're just wasting it. Uh, how do they get all this land? You know, so uh, so uh, you know, we're not just talking about about historical norms. Yes, they're historical in their origins, but they have not gone away. People still follow, um, in a sense, you know, whether they're consciously doing it or not. They're following uh, Locke and and Fatal uh, and Pope Alexander the Sixth. They're still doing this, even if they don't necessarily know they're doing it. They're still, uh, you know, that. Uh, those norms you know, have not gone away. Uh, that's really important to know. Um, it's, it's not just history here. Uh, now, this idea about about progress going through stages, starting off with hunting, hunting and gathering, uh, is something that was much talked about um, among uh, um, uh, um, thinkers in the Scottish, the, the Scottish and the French Enlightenment. Um, you know, John Miller, who's you know, perhaps a less well known contemporary. Of people like Adam Smith and David Hume uh, in in uh, in uh, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, well, was it Glasgow, but right? it's Scotland. Um, um, now, this is just an article that I came across, but but basically he he sums up uh, the thinking of of uh, Smith, Turgo, and also uh, uh, um, and Adam Ferguson um, um, uh, Miller said, you know, just so uh, just this this particular quote here: development should be regarded as proceeding through four normally consecutive stages. 
each based on particular mode of subsistence, hunting, pasturage, agriculture, and commerce. To each stage, they correspond different ideas, institutions related to property. To each, they corresponded different ideas, institutions related to government and in relation to each, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so, um, and of course, it doesn't take long before this idea of development through stages becomes quite sort of deterministic. Um, and, you know, the idea that you, things happen uh, in a different order uh, and um, people per persist uh, with uh, staying in one particular stage uh, because they they see no reason not to uh, is something that is, is very hard would have been very hard for these people to understand. Okay, so back to what well, well, uh, Cunha again. And this is a wonderful article, as I said before. Uh, so many great uh, uh, things to learn from it. It's quite a short article too. I recommend you read it. Um, and the boy said, "What comes out of the peculiarities of neotropical Sweden agriculture?" Is that it, re it resists so called progress, namely that irreversible evolution assumed by theorists to be universal foraging to domesticated life. Indigenous societies seem to have conceived of a forest that inhabit with non exclusive rights. Um, so, okay, so with that exclusivity, but you know, this whole idea that the, the progress uh, is something that is, uh, is irresistible. Uh, well, they have their own decisions that they've made, which are really quite uh, quite contrary uh, to all of that. Of course, again, Bolsonaro, uh, President Bolsonaro, uh, be, uh, president up to uh, uh, you know a little while ago, uh, the Indians are evolving more and more. They are human beings like us. Pretty awful stuff, he says. You know, but don't uh, think he's the only one who, who thinks this way. Okay, so since the 1980s, I mentioned before uh, that they, they, activism has intensified. And of course, uh, for those of you in Australia, you, you will know all about the Mabo uh, case, uh, which ended, you know, terra nullius, as this newspaper uh, article uh, says. Now, uh, what's interesting about this case, uh, well, there's lots interesting about it, uh, but what's interesting about this case um, um, beyond the renunciation of, of Terra Nullius is that Eddie Marbo himself uh, was from uh, that part uh, of Australia, you know, the Torres Strait, where, um, where a, uh, a, a known uh, and very visible occupation of people was actually gardening. So they were, they, you know, they, they, uh, these are people who, who tended the soil uh, and, and, and plants. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, an archaeologist uh, uh, quote I got from the book by Sutton and Walsh, which you may know about, uh, where he says it's interesting that Eddie Marbo came from what, that one tiny part of Australia that was actually occupied by gardeners. And, and he speculates whether um, the Marbo decision would have been made in the way it was uh, had, um, um, had the case... Uh, Actually arisen from uh, an, a, a, an indigenous um, 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 Aboriginal uh, Australian rather than some of the, the Torres Strait. Uh, of course, the assumption being then uh, that that uh, Aboriginal people did not uh, did not practice um, agriculture. And uh, I did ask um, um, can't think of a name right now, but uh, she's a Torres Strait Islander. Um, uh, it, it, Patricia Ajay, uh, I said, do you, do you think, yeah, because she is from Torres Strait, and I said, do you think that uh, um, that um, that that query, I mean, do you, you know, what do you think of this? She said, well, that's interesting. I, I don't really know. I, I've never really thought about this, whether uh, that might have, might have been uh, indecisive in the in the decision of the uh, uh, you know, of the judges uh, it influenced them in any way. Okay, and of course, um, the, you know, these are some of the drawings that, that Marbo made uh, of his uh, uh, of his uh, uh, of his uh, yeah, yeah, you know, of his community, uh, showing clearly. You know, you have uh, boundaries. You have bounded um, uh, um, lands used for gardening. So um, you know, from the you know the Lockean perspective. Uh, the argument could easily be made that they had rights in that land by by not just because of prior occupation, but by dint of the fact that they were actually um, 
uh, you know, they were attending the soil uh, and planting stuff. Um, so, um, but the the Lockean, uh, you know, lock would have seen the rest of the people on Australia, just Australians, as being uh, uh, as being um, you know, hunters and gatherers, and therefore entitled to no property. Um, I don't know if uh, you know Judge Brennan and the others had actually, uh, and Tui had actually, uh, you know, were. Uh, um, uh, were influenced at all by Locke, I have absolutely no idea, but it's an interesting thing perhaps to think about uh, you know, 30 years later. Now, and those of you in Australia wouldn't probably know about the dark emu controversy, and of course, uh, Bruce Pascoe uh, argues that um, that ab Aboriginal people had uh, urban uh, places of urbanisation, uh, they, they did hunt and gather, but they also practiced agriculture and cultivation, and this was debunked in by, by Sutton and Walsh, who said there's no really strong evidence that they did anything other than uh, hunt and gather. Uh, now, the, I, I, I have no idea who's right here, uh, but I do think their argument by Sutton and Walsh is interesting that they say that, you know, um, if, it, it, if it turns out that all they did was hunt and gather. If it turns out the evidence for anything else uh, turns out to be false, um, then you are left having to fall back on, um, uh, or at least you are you are, you're under threat. Let's say you're under threat that uh, those uh, who hold uh, that the hunt hunter and gatherers are you know simple societies living in a state of nature and therefore have no rights. Well. Um, in a way, you've got along with this whole narrative that you you have you, you, that that you have to do more than be hunter gatherers to get uh, to, to property uh, uh, rights, um, and of course uh, that is a, that is a, a, a interesting uh, thing to say uh, in light of everything I, you know I, I, we, we've covered so far in this in this uh, in this talk. As I say I really don't know uh, the rights and uh, and wrongs with it, um, but. I think Sutton and Walsh are at pains to point out that you can have a complex society. You can have complex society. Uh, ha and just the fact that you have subsisted for 60,000 years or have a lot, however long it is, uh, you're hunting and, and gathering as your means of, 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 of living. It, it doesn't mean it's a simple society. Uh, there's anything simple about your society, uh, and, and therefore, um, it, it, it's really uh, it, it's really uh, important that uh, that's understood. Okay, okay. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there. But uh, I think the whole discussion does 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 lead us to think again about these norms of you know ideas of progress and ideas of uh, uh, of um, Yes, whether um, certain certain you know um, primary occupations uh, make you a political society for the purpose uh, of, of government or having your own government, um, and and so forth. But uh, um, it's, it's an ongoing discussion. Now back to uh, back to the Amazon again, and uh, um, so these uh, are two people that that Darren knew very well. Uh, I, I took the photo on the right in 2018. I went to the 30th anniversary congress uh, in Belang. Now, um, the chap, the guy who had the, the, the lip disc is is uh, Chief Rowney, who's uh, apparently about 90 years old. Um, he gave a talk at the congress and a very, very powerful uh, uh, presentation, I have to say. Uh, and the chat next to him is uh, a very, a very dear old friend of Daryl's um, called uh, Panu Payakan. Uh, Payakan in his younger days on the left. Um, now Payakan, so Payakan uh, worked with Daryl uh, in the in a protest against the building of dams on their lands, and uh, was a very powerful uh, figure too. Uh, sad he died two years ago of uh, of COVID, and. Uh, uh, I was talking to a very uh, good friend on Zoom last month, uh, uh, who knew, who was very fond of Daryl and and knew very well uh, Paulinho Parkan, and she was trying to to help him when he was sick with COVID, and she does say, you know, that the Bolsonaro government uh, 
uh, policies towards the Amazon were uh, sort of directly to blame, actually, for the fact that his medical treatment was so late in coming and it's too late for him to, for him to survive. So, yeah, so, you know, um, pretty serious life and death stuff here. Uh, all right, okay, so... Um, but I also want to, want to I show this picture because I think actually um, about, you know, women as well uh, are uh, it, it, it actually indigenous women are, are also very much part of these movements and uh, very uh, powerful uh, speakers. And this woman here on the left, um, she's from one of the groups, I think, Northeast Brazil, uh, where they have some members of parliament in or members of Congress in uh, um, in Brazil, uh, in, in in Brasilia, so political activism they they're getting pretty good, very powerful. I remember uh, Rowley talking about how the populations are actually growing uh, in, in Amazon, so these people are having a resurgence in terms of population. So this sounds all pretty kind of positive. All right, okay, so I'm going to just sort of round up and sort of finish off now. Um, so you know, back to the uh, the book again. You know why. Uh, beyond intellectual property. Um, so in our book, we, um, of course, we, we, we try to explain, you know, what patents and trademarks copyright are, how they can be used, how they can be used against people. Uh, but we also argue generally that these are not going to be particularly useful, uh, except in some, in some cases, maybe trademarks can be quite useful, copyright could be uh, in, in some sense, but they're more likely to be used actually against you. And what we really need is some kind of over, uh, overall uh, system, of, system of protection, which Darrell called traditional resource rights, which are integrated rights, including human rights and uh, rights to development, uh, rights in land, uh, rights in knowledge and so forth. All of these rights are available in international instruments. But the problem is how to uh, how to integrate them and how to actually nationalize them, take them back to uh, back to back to national law. Uh, but we also perhaps, and, and certainly in, in, in time since the book, I've become somewhat sort of sceptical about whether this is any, ever going to really uh, happen. Um, uh, I have been following the WIPO uh, um, IGC Intergovernmental Committee, and um, so perhaps some of my thoughts uh, are reflected in my, my final couple of slides. So one thing I want, want to say is that many indigenous legal forms are based on very different logics and social relations include humans and non-human and animate entities and draw no distinction between nature and culture of the kind that we tend to draw uh, here, uh, us, you know, so-called Western uh, European uh, people uh, or people of European origin, I, I should very much say. Um, so, you know, we do this distinction between nature and culture, between the wild and the domesticated, um, so we have these decisions. Um, are they factual or are they artificial? Well, um, the, the point to be made is that we are imposing these, um, these assumptions on people who think in a very, very sort of different way. And of course, intellectual property, in a way, is uh, does assume that there is this sort of distinction between you know, artifact and nature. Uh, between um, what, what is cultural uh, and what is sort of out there. And <laughs> it draws these very strong, firm lines, firm sort of distinctions. So copyright requires originality, patents require novelty and inventive step, uh, you know. Um, so we have this, this very firm sort of distinction, which really, does not uh, exist in many, many other Indian societies. And although one shouldn't stereotype because of the fact that indigenous peoples are extremely diverse, uh, but time and time again, you do, you do find that there is this big difference between this, uh, these sort of you know, uh, dualisms that we have uh, and indigenous peoples who have their own dualisms, they have their own dichotomies, their own uh, sort of categories. Of course they do. Uh, the one that we have and on which so much of our way of thinking and our, our, our legal systems um, are, to depend on simply do not apply and are not really comprehensible even uh, to many uh, to many people. Though, of course, there is hybridization. It does go on a tool. Uh, it goes on as well. And you do find that lots of indigenous 
um, people, you know, they go to university, have degrees, uh, they become lawyers. Uh, and so they have to find a way to sort of, uh, to, um, um, to find some sort of way of, uh, uh, of bringing together, you know, their, uh, their, their indigenous uh, norms with the ones that they have been schooled in uh, to find some kind of modus vivendi. So intellectual poverty can only skim the surface and touch on a few concerns of indigenous peoples, but indigenous peoples who are increasingly embedded in the information age are involved in negotiations, whether they expect solutions or striving merely towards damage limitations. So you go to the IGC, you find the back of the room the indigenous peoples who actually are pretty vocal and extremely articulate. And one thing I find is that they do understand IP law, they understand intellectual property law, uh, but they also... Um, uh, and they also want to use use it where they can. They want to be, it. They want to be protected from its abuses, where it claims things that are theirs. Absolutely, do so they be in the room? Uh, but they also have, I think, quite a deep sort of scepticism, and that scepticism is based not just uh, uh, on the fact that the worldviews are so different, but also because. Uh, that you know, bridging the divide just doesn't really uh, seem to be particularly promising to them, uh, except perhaps in some limited ways. So the question, I suppose, is: Does it make sense to collapse the diversity and the specificity? Uh, sorry, that word is always find difficult. Uh, are it, are it is perspectives on nature and environment that tend to stress relatedness, kinships, complex sets of rights and responsibilities to a single role, holders, owners, stewards, custodians, guardians, or is that another kind of imposition? And I go back in a way to what Manuela Canoto Cunha was saying, uh, where she's saying that domestication isn't something the people themselves would see themselves as doing. Or it, if they do see themselves as being domesticators, they don't, they don't see only themselves as being people who domesticate because uh, their relations uh, in the animal world uh, in the spirit world are also doing the same thing. So in a way, they're, they're quite, uh, uh, they move away from the anthropocentrism, which of course we uh, very much uh, tend to feel. Uh, but in, so in arguing for them being, being sort of domesticators or being owners or stewards or guardians or custodians, the question is, are we actually imposing our own particular um, roles on them? And may that not necessarily be a good thing? And that's a question I, I, I struggle with. I struggle with much in the subject despite working on this area for 30 years. I still, I, I don't find it at all easy. Um, so a few weeks back, I was invited to Harvard Law School to, uh, by uh, Ruth Fakadiji, who's uh, been writing a lot about this subject. And he's, she's got very much into the idea that the, the role that they have on which rights should be based is that they are stewards. And um, she has quite a, let's say, a biblical view of what stewardship should be taken to mean in a way that actually actually helps uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, and I have to say, she is quite religious, but she also says, look, whether or not you believe in the Bible, the concept as formulated in the Bible is actually quite helpful. She thinks, and I sort of say, you know, well, that's fine, except, you know, by calling them stewards, is that what they want? Do they want to be seen as being stewards? And do they see it as being advantageous? So, you know, I, I, I'm slightly agnostic on this particular subject, as I am about religion generally. Uh, okay, so just to finish off, and I thought <coughs> a nice little image uh, to finish off of my talk um, is for an indigenous person. This is from a, a, an artist for an indigenous group in, uh, I think, in Canada, on the west coast of Canada. Uh, and she talks about the, the indigenous culture iceberg. So what non-natives can see more, most easily is material culture. Uh, what they can't see so easily is all tradition. It's, it's, you know, these are intangibles, of course, but also it's not just that they're intangible, it's that they, they can be uh, in some ways, um, while they can be grasped, you can talk to them about land ethic, you can read, Anthropological articles about traditional knowledge, of course you can, about all traditions, history, family, community networks. But the fact is that these are all inter yes, networks there, we are. So these things, you know, below the surface are all closely interrelated and that they, are, they form a network. 
Of course, the network includes what above the material culture. These are all network, they, uh, they relate to each other. And that does mean that um, a legal system which seeks to protect one of these and one only uh, may actually not be, be appropriate. So they want something that is sort of holistic, that, that covers all of these things. But of course, the broader you go, the more you, you move away from uh, the legal norms that are prevalent in the world and the legal approaches that are prevalent in the world. Uh, and you have to uh, completely um, change uh, the way that the law is understood, framed uh, and uh, uh, designed and, and adopted by, uh, by the international community, by governments. Um, and that's it's very hard to see how that can actually be uh, be, be achieved. So in the short term, I, I, I would say you have to really think, uh, follow indigenous peoples uh, who have been, I think they've been very creative in the way that they are using the word sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty uh, is, they are increasingly saying, like, we, we, if we have sovereignty, if people have sovereignty, we have sovereignty, that means we have uh, sovereignty relating to, to land. But they also say because of the links between land and knowledge and culture, we should have sovereignty over all of these things as well. Um, and uh, they even have a campaign for so sovereignty over data, so data sovereignty now. So I think indigenous peoples are being themselves are being quite creative. So maybe um, just to finish off, um, yes, we need to go beyond beyond intellectual property, uh, but to go beyond, uh, it's not for us you know, sort of westernized legal experts to, to solve this. We actually have to be followers uh, and not leaders as Daryl, although he was in many ways a leader, uh, he would see himself not as sort of leading into his peoples, he's supporting and actually following them. Uh, and it was a very dynamic, creative relationship that he had with indigenous groups and it was effective. He did stop uh, dams, him, he, he and, his, and, and his, his peoples themselves worked to stop dams being built. That was successful. Uh, we've got things on the on the political agenda that weren't there before, uh, but as I say, we have a long way to go, and it's still kind of messy. Uh, but this is a long term process, so um, I think I'll close here and thank you all for uh, listening. And uh, I'm very much open to any questions you might have for me. Thank you, Graham. That was fantastic, and uh, please join me. Oh, thank you virtual round of applause. Um, that was fantastic and wide-ranging, synoptic and provocative, um, typically brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, questions uh, for the Q&A. Um, I have my own questions lined up. Um, okay, so I'll ask a, a bold one, first of all, while people are forming. Yes, so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the bold one is this, um, what do we gain and what do we lose by using the intellectual property system as a tool to um, uh, redress these problems of inequality? Um, and so the, the kind of stark alternative is something like reparations. Um, hmm. Well, let me just first say that intellectual property is a rather strange place to look for for social justice. <laughs> it's a very strange place to look. Uh, but I think it's it's something that is partly unavoidable in the sense that um you know and you know and perhaps I'll go back to that information and network society idea. You are part of a network anyway. You are you know your knowledge is in the system, in the global system. So you have to you have to fight this in a way, and IP is is a stage that you have to occupy because otherwise it's going to be used against you without any kind of pushback, any kind of kind of you know uh, kind of opposition. I mean, but I do think you know if you look at the, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I think that forms a much better basis. It does refer to to, to enter to property, but it does refer to, you know, it, it, it is a whole lot more than just that. It's embedded in something much, much bigger. And some ways you, you look at it and it's, it feels almost over ambitious, but it's a declaration. You can you can be over ambitious in it, yeah, in a declaration. And sometimes you ask ask for a lot, and you might get a little. You ask for a little and you get nothing, that, that's for sure. 
Um, so um, I think, you know, in a way you have to push any button that you have. And uh, that makes things messy and complicated and rather confusing. And it also means you have to occupy so many forums. Um, and I think that's hugely difficult. But I mean, if you think about you know about uh, the UN and the peoples, this is a story that's only about forty, pretty much forty years old. I mean, the ILO back in the early twentieth century, there were some appeals by you know, peoples in, in regard to you know, peoples as laborers. Uh, but uh, yeah, workers, laborers. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, labor as being form the basis of certain claims to rights. Uh, but um, it's yeah, it, it, it's it, it's a messy scene. But I think in the last sort of since the early days days of the United Nations, invite sort of open the door for the peoples. I think uh, organization has been quite it's extraordinary development. It, it's been very impressive. But yeah, I don't have I don't have a major answer to your, to your question, Ruby Barris, but. Things are going on, and uh, and uh, it's, it, it's ten years from now, where will, will where will we be? Uh, there will be victories along the way, and there will be disappointments, but there will be victories. But it's uh, it's uh, it, it's a fascinating scene, you know. And uh, you know, I, I'm going to be out of it soon, probably because I'm getting old. But uh, and and uh, you know, uh, it'll be up to your generation to take over. <laughs> well, your generation, your of these peoples, plus their supporters of your of your your generation. Uh, Henrietta. Yes, hi yeah. Graham. Um, long time no, so long time no see. It has been a long time, definitely. Yeah. Uh, good to yeah. see you again. Sorry, I'm, 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 I haven't shown my face, but I, I'm just, um, yes. you still oh. can't see me. Um, but um, it, I had yeah. the pleasure of meeting Daryl when uh, he was in Australia and we, we both gave a paper yeah. presentation in Darwin yeah. and that was great, yeah. but uh, it was also great to work with you for a short period of time with the, you did, um, yeah. the Waipo Academy. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I have a question, Graham, and, and mm. you, you, thanks very much uh, for your presentation on, on uh, beyond intellectual property um, and why. Um, my question mm. is really about um, what we're seeing now is Indigenous people uh, how how do we protect uh, our cultural resource rights when Western mm. system laws are still excluding Indigenous people with, within those laws? But saying yeah. that, uh, what we're also seeing is that the international conventions and covenants uh, have been written many years ago and are since kind of further excluding um, our position mm. to be able to to really um, be included in trying to protect our cultural resource right, rights in terms of what's yeah. there. I mean, we still don't, regardless of native title, we still don't see uh, our cultural resource rights being recognized. Um, you yeah. you uh, highlight the issue of the, the smartness of looking at sovereignty, but we can practice sovereignty in general, but we are uh, under the specific and guidelines by the Western world, we're still being uh, marginalized to, to a degree. And as the yeah. years go on, it becomes, it becomes uh, a lot more weaker for us to really participate uh, on, on a global scale in terms of our indigenous culture and our resources and use of those resources to be able to benefit economically from it. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Henry. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah. Um, um, okay, so, um, well, sovereignty, yeah, of course, sovereignty is so incredibly important. Without sovereignty, you're kind of stuck because otherwise you're relying on, on, on your rights as individual people. But of course, sovereignty does sort of collectivize you and turns you into a group. Uh, and um, and what they they the ones who who don't who don't wish well on these people is one is they want to treat you as individuals, and uh, uh, and that, and I think actually that is something that international law is not really going to solve. Uh, uh, I think uh, that is going to have to be done at largely at the national level. Um, and and that's and I, I know uh, from Australia. I'm Australia since since the uh, the Mabo decision. You had the Native Title Act 1993. And from what I've heard, 
it's it's been quite a, a slow road to things really getting better. Um, now on the cultural cultural side of things, you know, in um, of course the the um, in terms of actually general income, because I did talk to uh, um, the president of the Shipibo Kanibo people uh, in uh, in in Ecuador, and they have really great. Um, 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 designs, uh, 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 textile design and things. And, and they say, look, you know, we don't have many sources of income, but this is one that we can have. And it's, uh, it's you know, uh, how do we actually monetize this when uh, there's absolutely no enforcement of any kind of rights here? And um, uh, so they can have all the laws in the world, uh, but that particular market in art and handicrafts uh, uh, is, is something that is, completely chaotic i mean it's the uh, um, internationally it's, a, it's it's an absolute i mean i mean mess uh, you know i went to uh you know the, the countries i've seen uh, these um 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 this ojibwe the, the dream um these these what they call, what they call i forgot what they're called now um the uh the sort of um dream catchers yeah they're made all over the world uh you go to bali and you find local uh, locals are making copies of didgeridoos uh they're copying lots of australian stuff you know it, it's a completely chaotic market uh and um uh, um i suppose you could say ip enforcement could be really good in this way uh but when you are uh, the underdog, you know, you're kind of stuck. So I don't know. I, I don't know what where we go from here. Um, and maybe I'm old now, and I'm sort of running out of ideas, perhaps. But uh, 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 of course, there's been much talk about about indigenous, you know, about indigenous law and, and customary law and things like this. And uh, um, and I know that's very tough. When I worked for a well, for UNCTAD, we, we we were organising this event on sort of knowledge back in 2000 and i remember i was writing this issue note for the uh, for for Unted, and i was strongly wanted to talk to write about customary law and uh, i was my boss demanded that we take that out of the text because certain countries would not uh, like it i think one thing uh, that makes things perhaps sort of difficult difficult in some ways this is not a, a north south issue um some of the worst offenders of of, of you know indigenous people's rights are actually developing countries uh, and that also makes things uh a little bit awkward but one thing i was heartened by henry was that actually indigenous peoples and the african group at wipo seem to be very unified be very unified um i thought that was kind of interesting i don't know what that's going to mean in in actual practice but uh, I, I found that sort of alliance building between, between indigenous peoples and actually government the government representatives in Africa uh, uh, that was something I hadn't quite expected, but there was a real kind of unity there. But anyway, I'm sort of waffling because I, I, I don't really know what, what the answer is, Henrietta. So but I'm coming over next month. I hope we'll meet up and we, we can That's talk great. about this more. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm coming over. Yes, I'm coming. I'm be, yeah, I'm coming to uh, UQ for a few weeks. So, uh, okay, yeah. well, I'm sure I'll be informed. So. Sure. Okay, that'd be lovely. It'd be good to see you, Henrietta. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? There isn't uh, anything waiting in the Q&A at the moment, Graham. Um, okay. Uh, right. I, of course, have more questions for you. That's, uh, always yeah. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, it's a, a cheeky question that speaks partly to your um, personal experience of the development mm -hmm. of the past 40 years, um, but also to the beginning of your talk. So um, when you were talking about dispossessory norms, uh, you mm -hmm. went uh, yeah. um, firstly a, a number of enlightenment theories, the labor theory of value, um, uh, the yeah. um, doctrine of discovery, terra nullius, and then uh, a couple of 19th ones around social evolution um, and the um, yeah. thing that's interesting um, from a historical perspective is that there was um, plenty of objection to these theories in the period in which they emerged um, and uh, yeah. in which those theories become transcendent in our later histories is an interesting one um, but yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to know is um, in your lived experience of the last 40 years 
Which theories strike you as being as interestingly world-defining and possibly problematic as those Enlightenment theories have been up until now? Um, oh God, because I, mean, I could name one, but then you would find, uh, but then, but then of course you you will find that uh, you know, even if you solve that one, there's there's yeah there's a backup, you know, sort of. Yeah, annoying theories and and and, and things. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so um, I mean, at the at the um, moment, I suppose you know, sort of thinking about today, what it really sort of gets in the way. Um, I suppose is that um, we, we have sort of fallen into the trap that you know it's um i suppose i don't want to i don't want to be horrible about, about economists but it, you know big economists you know everything has a value you know uh, uh and that can be monetized and i think you know um we've tried for, 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 for 30 years we've argued uh that you know bioprospecting is is economic rational and can be beneficial to people because of the fact that their their uh, their uh, knowledge has monetary value and, and I actually think that's not really the point. It has intrinsic value that is essential to culture and to lifestyle. And that's where we, we should be starting on. Um, I mean, I think that the people who want to sort of show as monetary value had in some ways were quite well intended in, in that they thought, well, we have to talk the language of money because that's what they understand. Uh, but the trouble is, is that much of it cannot be it, it it doesn't form raw material for the pharmaceutical industry it doesn't you know um it, and therefore when it turns out that it's, it's it doesn't have that kind of value then we say well then what's the point you know so i i think the intrinsic value uh of of, of this knowledge um yes it has some sort of utilitarian thing about about sort of conservation and sustainable use uh and i, I believe in pushing that as well too um, but I think you know we, we we do need to move away from uh, from uh, from justifications based on monetary value, and that's I guess that's all part and parcel of the sort of neoliberal world that we live in. You know, so yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. Um, we're just running past the hour now, so I'm going to make a, a final call for questions. Um, we've had a, a couple of people ask to uh, get in contact by email later um, because they've got more complex questions than we'll get through. Um, yeah, I'm just going to write something back. I'm just going to say uh, I, I want one question. If anyone wants to, any follow up queries, uh, there's Alana said, yeah, feel free to uh, feel, feel free to to email me. Yeah, yeah, I'm not hard to find. You may email just yeah, 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 I can, yeah. So uh, yeah, feel free to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so well, much. Thanks for inviting me, that, 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 that was great. I, well, I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs>